During my school years, I spent much of the summers making mods. I made maps in Jedi Knight 2 and Jedi Academy using Radiant. I made skins and wallpapers for The Sims with GIMP, which was awful. Occasionally I'd do some very raw, very simple coding to get shaders or scripted events in my map to work right. Most of the little bit of game development I know comes from those experiences, and although my interest in modding was short-lived and happened long, long ago, I've carried those skills with me for the rest of my life. It's easy to say that I wouldn't have this channel without having participated in an active, well-supported, and free modding community at the time. And that's why I care so much. The weekend of April 24th may have been the craziest weekend in game news ever. It started on Thursday, when Valve announced new ways to support workshop creators, which was a lot like Andrew Ryan asking, Is a modder not entitled to the sweat of his brow? Steam advertised this move as a way to support modders and finally give them money for their hard-earned work, a noble endeavor that I doubt anyone would openly want to argue against. But in practice, it was a greedy and exploitive program that gave modders an unlivable share of their unpopular products while taking away long-standing institutions that have been expected to be free from customers who supported these games in the first place. Within an hour, yet another artistic scene that wasn't completely about buying or selling some damn thing had their work turned into just another commodity to be exchanged, just like any other thing in the entire world. Anyone was freely allowed to sell anything. A statement from Bethesda boasted about this lack of curation like it was a good thing. No checks and balances, no regulation, no curation, no legal oversight. The market was supposed to freely determine everything and police itself, which means it only took hours for the modding community, which had turned within a day into a bitterly competitive marketplace, to devolve into the chaotic, laissez-faire anarchy of Rapture itself. Thursday, April 23rd, started the madness off with the release of 17 paid mods specially selected by Valve to kick off the program, and they were all horse armor. Little microtransaction trinkets that added nothing of significant value to the game for something of very little value from the customer. 50 cents got you a little two-part mini-quest to earn Gordon Freeman's crowbar. Five dollars makes your character wet and cold. For two dollars, you could go fishing. The most popular of the initial mods was the Shadow Scale Armor Set, which had to be added through the developer console rather than being placed or craftable in the game world. And it was only modeled for male characters, and that was two dollars. A few hours later came the joke mods. $99 buys you some high-resolution horse genitals. $29.99 to put an apple on a table. For 25 cents, you could buy a mod that allows you to kill the quest giver of that 50 cent Half-Life mod from earlier. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. And just a few more hours later came the first accusations and takedowns based on stolen content. Remember that $2 fishing mod? Turns out that it used another mod that allowed custom animations without permission. And since the creator of that mod didn't like the idea of strangers making money off their work, they asked Chesco, the creator of that $2 fishing mod, to take it down. So within day one of Valve's new program, one of their own selected mods was almost immediately taken off the marketplace. Optimists could hope that maybe this would all sort itself out as the weekend went on, but it set this program off to a violently clumsy start, and things only got worse. Friday, April 24th, was the day when torrents for paid mods started appearing. This is also when Chesco, the creator of that fishing mod, turned coat and wrote a long criticism of this system, calling it a failed experiment. He said that when discussing this project with Valve, their lawyers told them that using content from other mods was fair game, as long as the original content was free. But his experience with the community suggests otherwise. Meanwhile, we saw these monster mounts being uploaded from some guy named Tom, who was cutting, pasting, and individually selling work from a free monster mount mod without permission. And nothing was being done about it, because the system enabled it. There were no preemptive measures against theft, nothing short of a DMCA claim could take down a plagiarized mod, and that happens only after the original author notices it happening for a while. And this caused an exodus. Both free and paid mods were being removed from their sites because of fears over other people stealing stuff. Nexus reported that at least 40 mods had been hidden that day for this reason. Meanwhile, the Midas Magic mod, which was one of the 17 paid originals, released a free version updated to include pop-up ads in-game for the paid version. Sky UI, which provides a base work for hundreds of other mods that require its installation, which itself requires an installation of the Skyrim script extender, updated with the paid version that would have required 
countless more hoops for users to jump through if they wanted to have the best experience. But sure, you didn't have to pay. You could always just use free mods. No one was forcing you, after all. But here was a situation where the entire community, for both paid and non-paid modders, was being negatively affected by the temptations and the dangers of real money. Saturday is a day that Gabe Newell does not usually do PR. It cuts into his quality time. An AMA on Reddit clarified Valve's stance on these paid mods, with Gabe saying that it lied among other problems with Steam, like their customer support and Greenlight, and that they were looking to develop long-term, scalable solutions to address those problems exponentially over time. Which basically means to slowly create value where there was none before. And that's where the principles of this matter start to get divisive. I doubt anyone is averse to paying modders somehow, but the paywall is the problem. And Valve's implementation of that paywall created a laundry list of other problems. In the first few days, they learned how Skyrim's daisy chaining of dependent mods creates an incentive for content theft and vastly multiplies the amount of potential charges for customers. They saw how their system had no checks and balances in place to prevent that theft, and how that threat kept modders away from modding in the first place, even for free. They saw how it created infighting and exploitation inside the community, which already gets dramatic enough without the lure of real money. And most of all, they saw the incredible amount of backlash that comes from suddenly charging people for something that has been free for decades. And when that happens, it's impossible not to feel burnt. Let's face it, the young adults they're marketing to are growing up after the housing bubble, after the recession and the inflation and a cutthroat competitive job market rife with underemployment and mounting debt and the decreasing possibility of ever owning property or even having any kind of job security. The economic realities of the times we're living in are not alleviated by the constant, never-ending nickel and diming we get even after purchasing the most ironically expensive video games out there. It is alleviated by crowdfunding, or by going independent or even by the ad revenue here on YouTube. By basically cutting down costs to consumers who can more lucratively support work from reputation-based fan generosity, or just figuring out methods on not charging people for products at all. Valve's own games actually have better systems for monetizing user-made content than this. And actually, I doubt that there would have been nearly as much complaining if Valve put up a much more intrusive donation system instead. I would much rather click past 10 prompts in a browser to donate than pay $2 to go fishing. Because that's what $2 does. It turns a kid's harmless project, some student's free time practicing and gaining experience, into a garbage nothing product that represents a greedy cash grab rather than a constructive, productive pastime. Valve's lucky that for the few days the system was up, there weren't any major lawsuits from movie studios over the copyright violations that are rampant in the modding community. No software companies sued any modders after finding out that they were using their tools commercially on a non-commercial license, and no pissed-off customers sued Valve for being sold non-working products. Mods typically get away with a lot of bullshit because they're free and because their user base is so small. But once they're not free, well, they're suddenly much more liable for much more bullshit. The craziest weekend in game news wrapped up on Monday, April 27th, when Bethesda published a blog post defending this program. They said their early ideas for paid mods had to ensure that the market would be open and not curated at all. That's a really bad idea. They said it was years before Valve finally solved the technical and legal hurdles to make this possible. No, they didn't. They also said that only 8% of Skyrim players ever use mods, and less than 1% ever made them, and that makes this whole paragraph make no sense. How would they be expanding the audience for modding by raising the prices for modding? Why would they want to market something to a tiny 8% segment of super hardcore users who are going to know how to pirate those mods for free? Aren't those the same people who know that they've been given these same items for free for the past 20 years? Aren't these the same people who hated horse armor so much? Why would you sell those 8%ers a worse version of horse armor made by amateurs? Why would anyone buy this stuff? Why wouldn't anyone sell this stuff? They also revealed their share of the split. And if you ever needed an example of how absurdly, nakedly greedy this program was, it's right here. Modders get just 25% of the money customers give them, and that's assuming they make it past the $100 Steam Dev Wallet minimum needed to cash out, which really means they have to sell $400 worth of mods to see a penny of it. 
And seriously, it's it's 25%. YouTubers get a higher share than that, and we host much larger files. The company's percentage should be low enough to be considered a pittance of a licensing fee. All of this talk about what Valve and Bethesda deserve for the use of their storefront and their IPs is absurd, because both companies already exist inside of an infrastructure they built that benefits them from the mere existence of a modding community. Anything that they were pulling out of this was pure profit. And that's because of a fact that is so simple to understand that it just makes my head spin that so many companies get this wrong so many times. Modders sell games. Modders complete games. Modders fix games. Modders personalize, customize, lengthen, strengthen, and polish games. And as far as the publishers need to be concerned, that means modders sell games. The PC version of Skyrim would not have been as much of a success if there weren't modders to polish what was a visibly rocky game launch. Neither Minecraft, Dark Souls, the Stalker and Fallout series, or any other Elder Scrolls game, and even Half-Life itself would have been as popular without modders giving people reasons to buy those games. The program they tried here skims an absolutely minuscule amount of value away from the massive amount of value the modding community is worth. That 25% is going to look like nothing to the modder, and the rest of that 75% is going to look like nothing to these giant corporations. And more importantly, it gives people less of a reason to buy their game in the first place. Imagine how much less attractive an Elder Scrolls game is going to look if you know there's going to be no mods coming out for it. Or even worse, knowing that every mod is going to nickel and dime you out of your hard-earned cash. I'd rather just, like, spend four more dollars on a premium charge for the game to see the most popular modders get royalties or something, rather than face a $30 charge when I find 30 mods I like. That would at least feel cheaper. I would rather see a rotating selection of premium mods, commissioned by Bethesda themselves, release on a seasonal basis. I would rather see a Bethesda-picked cheap pack of paid mods cycle in and out every few months and become free afterwards. That's how Counter-Strike GO distributes its map packs. They're only $2, they're made by the community, they're selected by Valve, they're cheap enough to buy them with the fun bucks your imaginary gun skins are worth if you play the game regularly. It's self-sustaining, somehow. Granted, any of those alternate solutions have problems, but they have a hell of a lot less problems than this system did. When the bar for a product's quality and support is as low as it is with mods, then curation is suddenly much more crucial than it is with standalone games. And what's just as crucial is the fairness of the prices and the experience that customers are going to face. Just three hours after that Bethesda post, around 7pm, Valve flipped the switch. All the paid mod options were removed, all transactions refunded. Maybe they saw the light. Maybe they thought it was too much trouble to be worth it. Maybe they feared that a big lawsuit was inevitable. Maybe they just didn't like the negative PR. Either way, they said it wasn't a good idea to step into the modding community of a game they didn't develop themselves, even though they believe there's a useful feature somewhere in there. If they reconsider, I'd like to see them wait to see how the new Unreal Tournament does first. It's supporting itself from paid mods, but it's free to play, which is easier to swallow because there's much less of a burden on customers when the game they're paying to mod costs zero dollars in the first place. Entire fortunes have been traded on the Dota 2 marketplace, where the game is also free to play, but the purchasable content is strictly cosmetic, meaning that people who don't pay don't have to feel like they're missing out on something. It's the same deal with TF2. I would also be really interested to see what happens if more established modders follow Brian Shannon's example and try to fund their hobby through Patreon. A few days after the paid workshop closed down, John Romero talked about a plan they had ready in the mid-90s to pay modders an amount equal to the traffic their content drove to id's own mod website. Which seems fair. A developer sharing a slice of their pie with the people who help sell their games seems a whole lot less hostile than taking slices away from the customers. Because that's what this program did. It was an unfriendly, unfair, poorly thought out move that revealed gaming's capitalistic lusts at their worst. It favored the health of large corporations over the modders. It gave them an absolutely patronizing share of the value they have always been adding to their products at the expense of paying customers. And all that is just going to make these games less valuable in the first place. During the craziest weekend in gaming, a new economy was born and then died in just four days. Those who participated in it either went nuts or found themselves fighting battles they really shouldn't have to. 
It was an economy that enabled thieves and plagiarists to steal products from the rest of us, and no one had any incentives to fix glaring problems that would have affected everyone. And all of the lofty high talk that introduced itself as being all about supporting hard workers was quickly revealed to be misleading, misguided, sinister half-truths. Where the scientists would not be bound by petty morality. Where the great would not be constrained by the small. And with the sweat of your brow, rapture can become your city as well.